and we'll start with Mr. Machmacher. Hello, everybody. First of all, my name is Mike Machenbacher. Um, I am married and have four children. My wife, Buffy, and I have been married for nearly 14 years. Um, so as you can imagine, with four kids, I have a, a very busy household. Um, I've been living in Bismarck for approximately 24 years now, and I've loved every minute of it. Ever, ever since the day I moved here, I knew this is where I wanted to live for a long time here. Um, I've been working in the private sector since I was 18 years old. And uh, t the last 23 years I've been at Expressway Inn and Suites. Uh, the last 21 years I've been in management down there. Um, I'm also a board member of North Dakota Hospitality Association for the last eight or nine years. I'm also a board member of the Bismarck Diocese Pre-Marriage Seminar. Um, I'm also very active in youth sports. I've been coaching my son's baseball team for the past five years. And just recently the parents asked me if I would coach the uh, traveling team, which was an honor for me. Um, I've also been involved in several citizens groups, um, and what I'm trying to get at with all this here is I, I really think I possess the leadership abilities uh, which Bismarck, I think, really needs, and I think I would be a good fit with the city commission, and uh, I also possess a skill to listen, and as I have been going around knocking on doors, not as much as Josh Asfig has apparently, because he's beat me to half these doors, I think, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I really enjoy listening to what the citizens have to say. And if you just take a second and you know, really see what they, what they want, what their problems are, and what the solutions are, it's just fantastic to see, you know, see what their opinions are. And I think that's about it. Well, I'm running first and foremost because I am absolutely passionate about Bismarck. I've lived here cumulatively for 26 years of my life. And I just, there isn't anywhere else I wanna live. And we have some issues facing us that are, they're good issues to have, but they're big issues nonetheless. We have some unprecedented growth that requires long range planning. Uh, we need to take creative approaches to financing our infrastructure to support that growth. And our city services are stretched to the limit, so we need to streamline them for efficiency and hire more people where necessary, add technology where that's applicable, and collaborate with, county, uh, with the county government as often as possible. Um, we also need to maintain a diverse business climate so that when we come out of the other end of this boom, we aren't gonna suffer. And all of these issues circle back to affordable housing. So we need to increase the inventory on affordable housing as quickly as we can without compromising on quality and business co or building codes. So why am I qualified? Well, I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Minot State University. I've got 30 years of experience in business and public service. And I'm currently the operations director at Community Works North Dakota and the Lewis and Clark Regional Development Council, where we work on affordable housing and um, uh, economic development. I've owned my own successful startup small business, and I have experience in software development, project management, and process improvement. And finally, I have experience in constituent services when I was a consumer advocate for the North Dakota Insurance Commissioner. So on top of all of that, I love my community and I'm active in our Bismarck Rotary Club, uh, the Friends of the Library. I am a graduate of Leadership Bismarck Mandan and I'm a member of the North Dakota Women's Network. Thank you, and uh, first of all, let me thank the Bismarck Mandan Chamber of Commerce for holding uh, the forum tonight. It's always a excellent uh, when we get an opportunity to come out and listen and hear what's on citizens' minds about the future of Bismarck and talk about where we're going and appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, I think you could have done a little better on the cameraman, but that's a whole nother uh, deal. No, I kid. Uh, it's great to have Zach. He's been a great uh, asset, Kelvin, for you uh, to be in uh, contact with. Uh, Four years ago I ran, and when I ran four years ago, I said that I wanted to keep moving Bismarck forward and continue to build on the success that previous leaders like Connie Sprint and Attic, Sandy Tabor, 
and others had set the stage for. I think if you look at what we've achieved over the last four years and the list, the laundry list of awards and accomplishments would be way over my two minute time limit, so I won't go through those, but uh, you can see that we've been having some success. And if you look at the record that I built upon four years ago, <coughs> excuse me, when I took my seat on the commission, the first thing I did is say, where are we going? And we went out to the public, we went out to groups like the chamber and other groups and wrote the roadmap for the future of Bismarck that became the city of Bismarck strategic plan. I think that if you look at the work that has happened over the last two and a half years since that's been adopted, almost every action that we've taken since that's been adopted can be directly tied to that roadmap that you wrote. <coughs> We're 65% of the way on either substantial completion or starting on projects, and I believe we need to get that fully implemented, and I want to see that through. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you all that we could do that by June 10th, but we can't. So I'm looking forward to hopefully getting a chance to work with you for the next four years. In addition to fully implementing the strategic plan, I think we need to keep our eye on the ball about public services like adequate police and fire protection to ensure that your children and mine can continue to grow up in safe, clean, and, and thriving neighborhoods. So thanks for the opportunity. Hello, my name is Steve Marquardt. I moved uh, here in 1989. I've been uh, roughly in Bismarck 25 years and I raised my family here. I've uh, coached in Little League as, as Mike has. Um, so I've seen the growth of Bismarck. And with that, at that time, I decided I wanted to serve my community then. And I was fortunate enough for the citizens to vote for me for Bismarck School Board, which I've been a member of for eight years. Other than Josh, I'm the only other one that has worked with the amount of growth that we have, that we've had to sustain in Bismarck. Through my eight years, the school district has grown a lot with an average of roughly right around 300 to 400 and some kids. My experience on the school board in many different forms of meeting with the public, which I have in the past, has helped me to do, get an idea of what the pulse of the community is and what they are looking for in a community. While on the school board, we had completed uh, roughly right around, uh, when I first got on, uh, was Murphy and Miller, and then we did a renovation assembly in Walker, and then we built Sunrise Career Academy, which we worked with uh, businesses in the community, uh, Lincoln Liberty and Legacy. But with this growth, we have to make sure we maintain our fiscal responsibility. And I think that with my expertise in those areas on the school board, um, to watch those dollars and where we can spend those dollars is very vital. Now, with the Career Academy that we had built with the district, we had made sure that we were going out into the community and visiting with uh, everybody, and I see my time is coming up, so we will uh, work with that later. Hi, my name is Kim Badenhop, and I uh, decided to run because I chose to make Bismarck my home, and I recognized very quickly after living here that there are a lot of um, a lot of people wondering, including myself, what will happen to Bismarck as Bismarck is changing and growing. And I also wonder how Bismarck will handle all of this. We have you know, a lot of population growth, increasing traffic. We have public safety concerns that are increasing on a fairly regular basis. And new neighborhoods are coming along quite frequently, and we also have a lot of commercial development. And I have wondered, how will Bismarck handle this, and who is good to help handle this? So I uh, have you know, shared my thoughts and ideas with friends of mine, and earlier this year, a friend of mine that I go to church with encouraged me to run, um, knowing my skill set and my interest in being involved in the community. And so I gave very thoughtful consideration to whether or not this was something I was interested in doing. And I determined that yes, I do have the time to commit to do an adequate job and a good job with the commission. I think a lot of people aren't quite sure what's involved with the role of a commissioner and the fact that you need to be very involved with the city staff and listening to them and their guidance and also listening to the community and making decisions. So I um, have a lot of work experience that's very similar to the work of the commission and I also have a lot of real life experience living in communities that were growing <coughs> 
at the pace or a similar pace to what Bismarck is growing. And I've seen a lot of the long-term negative impacts that can happen if decisions aren't made in a thoughtful way. So I uh, made a decision to run, and I am very excited, and I look forward to hopefully being on the commission. Thank you, candidates. Uh, Mr. Markward, I will come back to you with the first uh, chance at the next at the next question. Um, Winston Churchill said the problems of victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. And while it hasn't been a war, we, uh, many people would say the economy has been a battle, and we are now on the victory side of it. As you, assuming uh, you, you land a role on the city commission, what is the most important agenda item on or that should be on the agenda, and where should it go? Good question. Um, we have to make sure uh, of where our growth is going and, and where that's at and how we're going to handle that. Um, and along with affordable housing, as uh, Nancy had mentioned earlier, you know, people are coming into the community. They need a place to live, and the, the affordable housing isn't there. So that's going to be one. But there's many different aspects of of a growing community that, that we need to take care of. And with us growing as fast as it is, there's many different topics that we could, uh, this could cover. I would say the uh, largest, uh, and, and they've worked on that, um, w you know, what the growth plan was they had just uh, uh, recently uh, adopted, but it's a plan. It's a, uh, a living document. Um, not everything is perfect in there, but it needs to be um, discussed. Uh, basically, I think we need to make sure that we uh, visit with everybody um, involved in the in the community and um, get their ideas on it. Thank you. Uh, I think probably the most important agenda item. I mean, we we do have the growth plan, and we have you know actively looking at downtown issues, and we have groups actively at looking at what to do on the north side of town. But I think the single biggest agenda item is going to be how to fund infrastructure in Bismarck. I know that federal funding is less and less dependable, and I don't think it's worthwhile to consider that that money will still be coming to us. And based on the way the city finances are set up, there are some unique situations with how we fund infrastructure. And so I think it would be very important for the commission to look at some new options. Uh, what are some new ways of doing that? Um, I know in my pro my profile for the chamber, I mentioned public-private partnerships. And while I am not claiming to ever be an expert in that, I certainly think it would be of great value for us to look at other communities and talk with people who are very familiar with that type of partnering to find creative and new ways to help fund the, the growing infrastructure need we have here. Um, one of the, like you mentioned, the economy is fantastic here in Bismarck. Um, one of the things that I see affected most by it is the fact that we now because of such a good economy, we lack a workforce. You see every business in town has help wanted signs out in front, and I mean, pretty much anybody can walk in, and as long as they got a heartbeat, you know, they'll get a job. Uh, but this is an issue you know, that we really need to address. We need good families to move to Bismarck here. I know up in the oil patch, one of the biggest problems they're having is that um, just these you know, single guys or single ladies are moving up there taking the paychecks, sending the money back home, and not spending the money in the state or in their cities. Um, we need to attract families, families that want to stay here and move here. Uh, just like Steve had said here, too, that um, affordable housing, everyone here knows that housing is not affordable right now. Um, a couple of things I think that we could probably do to help with that is, uh, first of all, I believe that supply and demand will eventually catch up and as the builders can get the supply up, the, the, the demand for housing will go down and the prices will go down with it. Um, the other thing with it is, and one thing that I could see uh, us doing is possibly um, taking the amortization periods and extending them out longer. Just, I mean, that's one little small solution, but at least we could get our house payments down a tiny bit. It's just one solution amongst many that ideas that I have and I'm out of time so I can't give you the rest. <laughs> Again, I think that all of our issues end up circling back to the affordable housing issue. Um, 
Mike was just saying that we need to attract families to fill all those open jobs that that would help expand our tax base it would help us uh, lower our cost of living and our you know then we kind of get into the catch-22 because then we need housing for all these families that are coming in and we need infrastructure for the housing so we can look at some, I think, some uh, creative ways to finance that infrastructure so we can get the housing inventory up as quickly as possible. Um, some of those options would be uh, getting rid of our special assessments and letting the private developers put in the infrastructure. Uh, instead of paying an assessment, you'd build it into the cost of your lot. That's one option. There's, you know, kind of a hybrid, a combination of a public-private partnership. Um, and then, in a larger sense, we could look at uh, having a paid lobbyist to work with the legislature to see if we can get some of the oil impact funding that's out there. We don't produce any oil, but I don't think that there's a county in North Dakota that is not impacted by that oil boom. And Cities like Bismarck and Minot that are out on the very edge really are feeling um, a lot of stress and strain. Well, I, th I think this is a great question, and I'll circle back uh, to my introduction about fully implementing the strategic plan. We heard a discussion about infrastructure. We heard a discussion about housing. We heard a discussion about a workforce. And if you look at the strategic plan, those are all pieces that are part of that strategic plan. So when I say my number one priority is to fully implement the strategic plan, it's because we need to look at how we handle infrastructure. It's the reason in my responses to the chamber in writing, I called for a public task force that included business leaders, citizens, and other interested parties to take a look at how does Omaha, Nebraska do it? How does Fargo do it? How does Billings do it? What can we look at to fund public infrastructure improvements? When we look at public safety needs, is it time to rethink how we do police officer and, and firefighter allocations? In other words, for every subdivision we add, do we need to think about adding an officer? Those are things to think about in terms of how we enhance our quality of life and continue to keep the quality of life as we grow. All right, um, on a very positive note, the, uh, the candidates are very much focusing on the topics that have, have, have bubbled up through the chamber and through our membership. So some of this is going to be a little bit repetitive, but I, I, I'll ask you to give specifics and or say that you've already given your specifics and you can pass it along. And uh, Ms. Guy, I'll, I'll put this to you first. Um, what is the city's role in affordable housing? <coughs> As I've met with uh, leaders throughout the community, I'm hearing lots of really great ideas. Um, I, I'm hearing that we could do some streamlining in our uh, permitting department with permits and inspections. And I hear that there is a, a software solution in the offing, and of course that makes my heart sing. Um, I like to see technology applied where it can really um, make things more efficient. So if we could speed along the permitting and the inspection process, again, if we could work with private developers on, the, um, on, on getting the infrastructure in quickly so the houses can go up, I think that'd go a long ways towards solving the housing problem. And really, the only solution is to get the inventory to catch up with demand. Thank you, Kevin, and um, I think that the city has three roles when it comes to affordable housing. The first one is that we're a planner. We need to take a look at where are the housing needs going to be, because if you look at the infrastructure needs in the future, obviously you're going to need to understand where the housing is going to be, commercial, et cetera. The second role I think we play is a convener. Who are the builders in town? Who are the interested nonprofits and others that we need to have at the table to help find creative solutions to do it? And the third one I would tell you is a partner. You know, we every year get community development block grants allocated to us from the federal government. It's one of the best programs that the federal government does because they give it to us and they allow us to say, within these broad parameters, use it as you best see fit in your community. Unfortunately, we know what's happening with the federal government and their funding situation, 
but what we do is still get those funds and make sure we allocate them towards affordable housing projects and partnering with community partners to get that done. So I would say that we have three roles. It's to be a planner, a convener, and a partner. And I'd have, you know, one thing with going third, you <laughs> just like in the school board, if someone else says something else, you know, why even, uh, why even expand on that a little bit more? But, you know, like Nancy and Josh had said, you know, that those are all aspects of it. Um, it, we need to make sure that we visit with the other public entities and where, and that's in that strategic plan that Josh has mentioned, is as far as we need to visit with the s schools. We need, you know, where are we putting schools up? That's going to kind of drive where some of our housing is going to be. You know, we need to visit with the uh, parks. That's where, you know, uh, houses are going to be around the parks. People are going to want to build around those. Um, you know, just keep an open dialogue with the community and let them know what's going on. Um, you know, and I think the city has done that uh, to a certain extent, but I think we have to be a little bit more um, proactive in that and get out in the community so we, the, the people understand what the trouble is um, w with doing some of this and uh, ha make sure that they have a say in um, where our community is growing. As I've talked with people and listened to people, I recognize that the hottest topic about housing prices seems to be doing away with or lowering property taxes. And I know that this is an issue that the city commission is directly involved in. I also am aware that there's a significant amount of city funding that comes from property taxes. So I think it would be very important for the city to work with realtors and builders to talk through and strategize ways that we can help curtail the increasing housing cost here in Bismarck. And I know that it's, it is a downside of an up economy to have increasing housing prices. So I think if we increase the density of housing in certain areas, that certainly will provide some more affordable options. And then I think there needs to be some thoughtful consideration about what is the tax structure, how does the city benefit from that tax structure, and is there any possibility of using that as a way to maybe offset some of the cost? And then. Um, I've got a couple other ideas also here, and you know, like was already said, simplifying the permit process is one of the main things that I've s spoke with several of the builders around town, and it seems to, you know, come back to that almost every time. Um, I also just said, you know, last time too, extending the amortization period from seven to ten years, maybe fifteen years, something like that, would also lessen them. Another thing we could look at is with the interest rates hovering around four percent right now, and this city currently is charging five and a half percent on specials. You know, that's another you know, possibility we could do, and those are just small solutions. It's, it still goes back to supply and demand. We need to give the builders the ability as quickly as possible, but they still have to do it correctly. But it's a, the supply and demand is what's gonna determine the prices of homes, and that's where we need to concentrate on. Thank you. Um, Ms. baden -Hop, I will put the next one uh, on your plate first. Uh, the question is, as our community, continues to thrive and attract an overwhelming number of young professionals. Um, what is What are you doing to listen and or reach out to them about community issues? And if elected, what would you do more of or differently to draw more interest and ideas from the young professionals? Okay, so you're asking about existing young professionals, not how to get more young professionals. The, the, that is my interpretation of the question, Got it. yes. Okay. Um, well, I think that it's very important, if you're in elected office, it's very important to listen to as many constituent as many constituent groups as possible. And I would certainly be interested in reaching out to some of the young professionals. You know, they are, they are the ones who are very likely to be impacted with the long-term effects of the decisions that are being made today. And so I think it would be great to get their ideas. I think oftentimes elected officials don't, I think, I think a lot of younger professionals are concerned that they don't have a voice or that they're not going to be heard. So I would actively seek to find the groups where they are located and talk with them and certainly encourage them to voice their opinions and get very involved with groups and committees that are studying ways that we can grow. Um, <clears throat> I, I get the, I get, 
the ability to talk to a lot of people in the in a, especially younger ones coming to town here. And one of the things I hear all the time, although I disagree with it, is these younger people that want to move their families here always tell me there's nothing to do here in Bismarck. I mean, they're, they're wrong. There is plenty of things to do here in Bismarck. But, you know, and also in coaching baseball here and being very active with youth sports, I, I've heard horror stories about these kids having to have hockey practice at 9 o'clock because we only have three sheets of ice in town here. I've, uh, my kid played traveling basketball and they were practicing twice a week and it's nearly impossible to find a facility to have basketball practice at, even with all the school gyms. Um, we need to look at, if we're going to be moving small, or s moving young families to the city, we need to be able to provide a quality of life that we can support so they stay here and they want to, and they want to stay here. And even though there is thousands of things to do in the city and I never have a problem finding something, you know, we need to, we need to advance along with the growth of the city. Uh, so as these youth sports grow and such like this too, we can provide, uh, you know, like I said, sheets of ice and basketball courts and stuff like that. And I think one solution to this, and I've spoke with some of the developers, is I really would like to see um, done with completely private dollars and all the user groups getting involved, um, maybe a multi-use facility, probably on the north side of town that will not compete with the Civic Center, of course. But uh, uh, I would like to see something like that. And I think it can be done if all the user groups are put in and have a little piece of the pie. Um, about a week or so ago, I actually had a meet and greet type of event right here at the chamber, and we had probably, oh, 20 or 25 young professionals that I had never met before, and it was really an interesting conversation that we had. Um, they were telling me that uh, almost, to, almost every one of them said they want downtown housing. They don't want to live out in the suburbs, which made me chuckle. <laughs> Apparently, we now have suburbs. Uh, they want to live close to downtown. They want to live where the activities are and the action is. And so I think we need to pursue that with, along with our downtown sub-area plan. And uh, you know, part of that sub-area plan is the that kind of triangle between downtown, the Civic Center, and the mall. So we need to continue to cultivate those um, new businesses coming in downtown along with the restaurants and see what we can do about some interesting downtown housing that's affordable and try and attract those young people to um, give that downtown its character. Thank you. So how do we get more people like me uh, to stay here in Bismarck? Uh, one of the great things I love about being on the City Commission is I'm the youngest by far, and that I get every day to help uh, provide the perspective of what it means to be a young professional in a boom town, in a town uh, that we've now built our family and continue to raise them. And, and the three things that I hear when I talk to my colleagues and my fellow uh, young professionals are this. Uh, Downtown is the place. It's the attractant for people because they can start a business, they can grow and do whatever they want wherever they want today. In the age of the internet, it is what it is. It's the place that's going to attract them there and our downtown is becoming the hub for young professionals. If you've been down there, f when we moved here a number of years ago, uh, on a Friday night, it was okay. If you go on a Friday night down there, good luck. Uh, because the sidewalks are packed, the streets are packed, and that's in December. Second thing I would tell you is that they're uh, attracted to a quality of life in terms of where they want to live. So if they don't want to live downtown, they want to have access to parks. That's why I pushed for a neighborhood park ordinance to ensure that all of our new developments don't become a suburb and don't become uh, those places where that's just where I live, but here's where, here's where I grow. And so I would tell you that uh, in combination with all of those, uh, if you go back to the strategic plan, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but if you come back to that, that's why those things are in there. We heard very clearly from young professionals, and we made sure to include them in that uh, about what is it that's going to cause them to be the next Microsoft in Bismarck, the next KLJ, or the next, program, the next business that grows and, and, and can call Bismarck its home. Well, one thing that we do is, is keep working with the chamber and our uh, other uh, uh, user groups uh, when the, these new young professionals uh, move in. Our Downtowners Association, I'm sure 
uh, does a, a very good job, and so does our city commission uh, currently at this time. Uh, one thing with uh, was nice on the school board is we usually had a community forum every year. Uh, and to get to understand um, if there wasn't something that we had uh, provided to our, our uh, public, um, you know, they had a chance to uh, let us know what they were looking for. Uh, the most, uh, one that we got the most of was when we were uh, talking about the, the Career Academy again. Um, we actually visited with the students. And they, they were the end user. What are you guys looking for when you go out into the world? Basically, that's where the Career Academy came from, was from their ideas. So I think if we get together as a group and um, with these young professionals that are moving into the community, and like I said, the chamber and the community forums and be able to visit and see what they want. Uh, like Josh had said, there's the strategic plan that they have in place has talked about that, and, and a lot of us don't understand that. Um, you know, they they did the legwork to get to the point that they have, and that's why the downtown is as busy as it is. It's nice, even for myself, a little older than you, Josh, <laughs> but to be able to go downtown and to be able to visit with friends and uh, you can be able to walk walk around, and it, like you said, even in December. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Aspig, I'll go back to you for the first answer on this one. Um, one of the things the Chamber has always advocated is collaborative government. Um, what is your what is your view and how far should we be looking to go on collaborative government with the school district, the park district, the county, our sister city across the river? Thank you, uh, Kevin, for the question. And that w one of the things that I think uh, we we've probably been a little short on is is the ability to uh, work across uh, governmental structures. One of the things that uh, I've worked in my tenure, and if you look at uh, the different projects we've run, we've always tried to go out to the to the public and get public input. But working across school board, what uh, county government, park board, city. Uh, the MBBM project that had started a number of years ago and then kind of flamed out, uh, I think we need to take a look at is it time to, to rejuvenate that or take a look at that. Uh, I would be the, the last one to be able to tell you why that, that hadn't worked the way I think a lot of us saw uh, it should, but I think part of it is when you talk about cross-governmental issues, uh, each one of them has their own funding mechanisms, each one of them has their own uh, things, and so some of those discussions get difficult sometimes. But uh, I would tell you that uh, anytime we can find ways to streamline or uh, unduplicate services uh, between, go between governmental entities is a positive if it's going to ensure that the quality is still there and yet cost less. One thing with the school district uh, that we did was exactly that. Um, you just look at the community bowl. Uh, the city, um, school board, private, public, um, but even on the school district, we work with the, the Parks and Rec and um, visit with them, let them know where the school's going in, this is what, uh, how many acres we have of, of green space, and uh, partnered with the playground equipment or uh, fencing or, you know, just different things. So I think we need to make sure that we um, work with all the entities even though that there's there's different funding mechanisms, but I think the being able to get together and, and to visit and um, you know bring all those questions to front and it's just going to help you know make us be a better community so we don't have to worry about uh, 5 a.m. Uh, hockey practice or um, no gym space and we built the gyms as big as we can, but that's also the, what the community has given us as far as dollar amount that we need to do is on the school side. So I mean, but be able to work with the other government entities, um, it needs to be it needs to be fluid, and we need to see more of it. Living in a community like this with another community and county right across the river is certainly not a unique situation. Um, it's definitely beneficial to everybody involved if we can find ways to work with the county with the other city, the other county that we have nearby. I think oftentimes um, it's easy for 
for people to jump to conclusions about what they want, what they want to achieve for their own community. And what I think is important is to try to listen to what those around in the surrounding area want and try to find a starting point with common ground. You know, are there certain points where we can agree with the counties and communities that surround us that might be a starting point to help improve the relationship we have with, with some of those other commissions? So I think it's vital to how we grow, and I think it's vital to maintaining the quality of life here, and I certainly would be very open to trying to find as positive a working relationship as possible with our neighbors. And I would agree also that any time that you can streamline government, um, I mean, that's fantastic. It, it saves the taxpayers money, and it, uh, it gives everybody the opportunity to work together and to avoid duplication. Um, you know, for example, you know, the Burley Morton County Detention Center that was being worked on, great, great step in the right direction. You know, uh, streamlining it, save everybody money. Um, one, one problem is when government entities don't get along and don't work together, everybody pays the price. All the taxpayers pay the price for that. And, uh, you know, recently, especially with the extraterritorial zoning problems that they were having, it, you know, the, the city wouldn't give, the county wouldn't give. Finally, I'm glad to see that they finally did, you know, come to some conclusions here and, and you know, progress forward in that. But, you know, the, what I keep hearing about this is that the citizens in that, in that extraterritorial zone can't vote for the people that are making the decisions for them, which is a very valid argument. How do you change it? I don't have the answer for that. I'm sorry. But I think what we need to do is to listen. You know, the county commissioners and city commissioners need to listen what, uh, you know, what's being done there and listen to what the citizens are saying. And then, you know, and the citizens on the other hand also need to realize that Bismarck can't grow up. You know, it needs to grow out. Um, so we need to come to an understanding between city and county especially, I believe, to help Bismarck grow properly. I think collaboration is just really an, an important uh, tool in our toolbox. Um, you know, all of the above, we need to collaborate with the Parks Department, the school board, and the counties, and with the city of Mandan as often as possible. Uh, our new county jail that's being proposed is just a really marvelous example of that collaboration. Um, it, it's just, uh, it's going to save all of the entities involved in it a lot of tax dollars. But there are other areas that I think we have some opportunities. Um, there's, of course, corrections. There's law enforcement. There's um, infrastructure financing, um, maybe human resources, uh, waste management, planning and permitting. All of these things that we all do, maybe we could collaborate, do them together, and do them less expensively. Thank you, candidates. Um, Mr. Machenbacher, I will come back to you uh, with one that, that we've touched on. Many of the candidates have touched on uh, earlier, but I'm, go I'm going to come back and just focus in on it and ask, with the, with the rapid growth that is an opportunity and a challenge, where do we go with infrastructure funding? Um, just as Josh has touched on many times tonight, you know, I have reviewed the growth management plan. and. Uh, I think it is a fantastic step in the right direction. It, it's very non-controversial, it's very open to ideas, and it works, and it, there's attempts in there to be made that will work for everybody, for citizens, for builders, um, for everybody. And as far as funding, um, you know, the, the tax increases are absolutely out of the question, if you ask me. I think we need to just manage growth, and as these, as these new entities are coming, or I'm sorry, new suburbs, <laughs> as they're called, are coming in here, um, you know, they need to be able to, you know, pay for what's coming up there. And I don't think, you know, someone on South 12th Street should be paying for streetlights for somebody that's building a home up in Boulder Ridge or something like that, you know, just for an example. I think they can all sustain themselves. I, I really think that's the way it should be. And even talking to the builders, they agreed with that statement that, you know, as, as we grow, this, the, the tax base that'll increase where there should be able to um, fund all the new stuff. Well, I think, you know, we really do need to make a very concerted effort to hold down our, 
our taxes as much as we can, you know, it, it wouldn't be hard for things to sort of get out of hand, um, just as it wouldn't be hard for the growth to get out of hand if we don't uh, continue with the good planning that, that we've done so far. Um, again, I'd go back to that lobbyist. You know, I think we need to have somebody who is whose only job is to go out there and find funding, whether it's state funding or federal funding or grants. Uh, we need to get kind of creative about where this is all coming from. Um, and then, again, you know, with the affordable housing, I think that we can partner with these private developers and not only move things along more quickly, but perhaps do it less expensively than we have in the past. Well, this is an excellent question because during my tenure on the commission, the biggest concern I hear about is special assessments and how do we pay for our local portion of infrastructure improvements, new infrastructure, et cetera. And if you look at what's happening with the Federal Highway Trust Fund, because that's where a lot of the funding comes for new roads, especially, the dollars are going, well, for you guys, it'll, I have to go the other way. It's starting up here uh, probably five, six years ago, and by next year they're talking about uh, somewhat less than $2 billion. Uh, roughly, or 200 billion, I, don't, I might have missed a zero or two in there, but the, the, the long story is that it's dropping off dramatically. And the fact is that comes all the way down to our ability to grow. So how do we do that? Well, I told you earlier, I'm calling for a task force that includes citizens, that includes uh, business leaders, it includes uh, a city commissioner to chair it. Uh, I have a good idea of who that might be. There's a few that I still owe of some favors uh, uh, on. I'm looking at you, Commissioner Grossman, in the back. Uh, no, kidding. But as a city commissioner to chair it, and take a look at what are all the options out there? What, what should we be looking at in terms of funding? I don't pretend to have all of the answers. And if you've looked at my work over the last four years, this is a process we used when I was told that passing a neighborhood park ordinance was a fool's errand. Well, guess what? We used that process. We found a solution that's worked for everybody, and we're looking forward to seeing that build out. And if you continue to look at how we build going forward, I think that's part of the answer. The other thing I would tell you is that I agree we do need to do a better job with the state legislature to say, hey, it's not only Dickinson, Williston, and Minot that are feeling the oil impacts. We are the white-collar capital of the oil boom. You don't believe me? Look at all of the new law firms and engineering firms that we see in our community. They're coming here. Why? We now have airport access. We now have some of those things that they need, uh, like the state capital, to do the permitting. So, And just like the other members had said, you know, basically we need to make sure that we look at all aspects of funding to be able to handle our growth. We have to keep in mind that we are a community as a whole, north, south, east, west. That infrastructure uh, allows us to go from the south side of Bismarck to the north side of Bismarck, east to west. So you know, everything, that discussion needs to take place, and, and I uh, commend Josh, you know, for, for wanting that task force because that's what needs to be done. To have, a, to have that discussion and, and to be able to visit with the community and get their ideas. It, there could be something else that's out there that, you know, maybe that we're missing. But to have that conversation um, like I said, we need to make sure that we look at all aspects and how we're going to finance. As far as the rapid growth and where we go with infrastructure funding, uh, the original question, I did address quite a bit of that earlier and that I don't believe we can rely on federal funding and I, need to, we, I think we need to look at some creative options. Uh, the growth plan has been brought up several times this evening and it's a very thoughtful plan and it goes a long way to looking forward at how we're going to grow and it made suggestions about funding. It did not make any final determination about funding. And based on what I read about those suggestions, I think there are additional options to look at. And so I would like to see the commission and the new commissioners look at what are some additional opportunities for funding. And I think we have a long way to go with looking at that because I'm not sure that what's been proposed so far is completely adequate. Uh, Mr. Marquardt, we'll give you uh, the first answer to, the, to this one. Public safety has been an increasing challenge for cities to the west and, and our community. You know, how do we stay ahead of that challenge? Very good question. The thing is, again, is funding. 
Uh, one thing with the growing community, uh, we looked at that in, in, in our school district also with the, the amount of rapid growth that we have and the buildings that we have is the SROs and how to cover that. We worked with the city and uh, got that taken care of for a year and to be able to handle that. But one thing with a growing community, as we had seen with the, the school district, is you have to be able to grow those services to a certain extent and how far we need to cover. And that's one thing that's kind of, um, as far as on the fire side, uh, to be able to cover the outlying areas of, uh, of Bismarck. Um, as far as on the, on the safety aspect, same thing, you know, we're getting so big, we're stretching our officers thin, we have to look at um, being able to add officers uh, to be able to handle the, the large growth uh, that we're encountering. One thing it, it comes back to is funding and how we're going to fund that. And we need to have that discussion um, with the community. Kevin, I apologize. Do you mind repeating the question? Oh, public safety and public how we Public safety stay. has been an increasing challenge for cities to our west as well as for our yep. community. <laughs> um, how do we stay ahead of that challenge? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I am very aware that public safety is an increasing concern in Bismarck. I know that people are concerned about the safety of even shopping at places that they used to go shopping and feel very safe. And I know that people are concerned about protecting their own homes and how safe it is for them to, to be in their neighborhood um, or in times when they may not have been concerned about it before. So I, um, I have talked with Chief Donlan. I have asked him about the state of the police force and what he sees as some of the growing needs in this community. And I know that um, I'm very confident that we have an absolutely superb police force in this town. And I know that they are very aware of the challenges. And so I, I have to say, first off, that I'm impressed with what we're already doing. And I think it's important for the commission, and as a commissioner, I think it would be very important to listen to those people involved in protecting us and providing public safety and finding out what they need and how we can be supportive of them. Because anytime you're drawing new people to a town that are not from the town, that don't have the same sense of community that those people who have lived here their entire lives have, it becomes an increasing challenge. And so I, I would definitely want to listen to and be supportive of the police department. For those of you who have uh, seen the platform that I've put out, the number one thing I have on there is police, fire, rescue. It's, we need to absolutely provide a safe community for our, our citizens to live in. Um, one of the things that, you know, you know, like you asked her, Kevin, is to prevent what has happened in Wilson and Dickinson and some, Dickinson and some of these other areas out there in the oil patch. Um, if you look at the police reports and see who are the, you know, perpetrators, I guess you would say, most of them aren't from North Dakota. They're all from out of state. And these are the ones, you know, that's what's being attracted to out there by what the jobs are that are available out there. Bismarck needs to concentrate on attracting the right people. And that's families, like I had said also once before. Let's, let's make Bismarck a destination city where families want to move and want to grow. And we have to provide, just like I said, a safe community for them to do so. And that, and then that means you know, providing police, fire, and safety with everything that they would need. Maybe not necessarily everything they want, but everything that they would need to provide that. You know, that's manpower, technology, and whatever else they would need. We have just a really top-notch uh, law enforcement community here in Bismarck. They've had a real challenging last couple of weeks, and they just keep catching the bad guys as fast as they can oh, rob banks and stuff like that. Um, in my conversations with um, uh, leaders in the law enforcement community, I find out that we're actually down like 10 or 11 officers right now. And on top of that, we perhaps need five more. So we need to keep revisiting their, their uh, pay structure to make sure that it's competitive with the oil field and with uh, private business. Um, try and hang on to them for as long as we can. And 
Um, I'm also, I've also heard that they are working on a rather innovative way to schedule their shifts so that they can actually cover more ground with less manpower. And of course, that's a process improvement, so I got real excited about that. And I think it will be a lot easier on the officers, too, in the long run. Um, so then I think the last thing we can do is just keep, again, addressing, you know, looking to the future, plan ahead. As we're opening up new developments, as Josh said, do we need more law enforcement officers? Do we need more, are we going to need another fire station at some point? So we just have to keep taking the long view. Thank you. And uh, public safety was one of the themes that came out very clearly when we did the, st the strategic planning process. And if you look in the strategic plan uh, that the commission passed and that you all helped write, uh, it, it's very clearly something we need to work on. What that means to me is more cops, more firefighters. Uh, there's no other way around it that we can do shift changes, and they are talking about doing shift changes, but at the end of the day, if you grow in population, you need more public safety officials. There's just no way around that. And so then the answer is, how do you pay for it? Well, what a lot of people don't fully realize is that when you look at the city budget, what does property tax cover? Property tax covers public safety. Everything else we do in the city is either funded by a user fee, sales tax, or some sort of grant. So public safety is funded by property tax. And so then the discussion is, what does that look like? What do those funding models look like to make sure that as we grow, we add those officers? You know, we've done an excellent job, and uh, kudos to Commissioner Grossman. He holds the police and fire portfolio as well as the budget portfolio. He does an excellent job for us at doing that. But I do think one of the things that uh, when Chief Donlin and I were talking this morning uh, at the coffee shop, we happened to bump into each other. I asked him today, where are we at on hiring? He said, you know, we, we were down eight, we've hired six, they're going through the training process now, so it's six weeks before we can actually get them on the street because they, we have to go through our intake process. So we're still down two, but then we're gonna have some retirement. So we've got plenty of work to do in this area. But the other one is fire, fire safety. Uh, when you talk to our firefighters, what's their number one concern? Their number one concern is many of them, when they start on their for force, the first fire they go to is the first time they've been in a live fire. And so that's why we've issued an RFP to look at a burn building and provide some of that training in addition to a space for a future fire station. I will note in the interest of public safety, I've seen more traffic stops in the last two days uh, than I'd seen in two weeks, so drive carefully going home. <laughs> it has been a, a, an excellent panel, uh, lots of insights, and I will wrap it up with the same question that we have, uh, have asked of the other two, and Commissioner Askvig, I would uh, put this to you as first, is we are on the, on the precipice of a lot of opportunity for the city. What's, what's your vision for Bismarck? Well, first of all, let me just take a second again to thank uh, the Bismarck Mandan Chamber. I want to thank all of you who came out tonight and all of those of you who uh, will watch it later. Uh, thanks for your input and all the discussions we've been having. Uh, the future of Bismarck is bright. One of the things that as we look at where we're going, uh, there's a lot of change happening in Bismarck. And one of the things that I believe I bring to the table is a steady hand of consistent leadership. If you look at my record over the last four years where we've instituted the strategic plan and we've instituted a number of the things that you all have asked us to work on, I look forward to hopefully continuing to work on those and build so that the Bismarck we know today is even better in four years. You know, one of the great things about serving and living in Bismarck and starting a family with my lovely wife, Crystal, she's here tonight, and thank you for being here, uh, honey, as well, is that not only do I have a stake in Bismarck myself, but I have a future investment in Bismarck. My kids are going to grow up here. They're going to go to school here. They're going to graduate here, and I want them to be proud of the city we call home. So when I look at what's the future of Bismarck, I think it's bright. I think it contains one little blonde head boy and two little blonde headed girls, uh, hopefully not getting into too much trouble or traffic stops. But uh, again, thanks Kevin, thanks Zach, thanks Kelvin in the chamber, and uh, I hope I can earn your vote on June 10th. Vision of Bismarck. We've had this uh, discussion on the school district, and that's where um, my leadership skills have, have shown. 
uh, said eight years in school district, and I've seen the growth. We've worked with the growth. We've worked with the community. We've worked with the rest of the public entities. And I think that leadership skills, being president two years on the, in the eight-year period, has helped with that. Where do I see Bismarck in the vision? Like Josh said, it's very bright. But we need to maintain our community, and we need to um, run our government effic efficiently and with the idea of possibly lowering property taxes. But we have to keep in mind with our community that those property taxes, like Josh said, help pay for some of those services. So, you know, I see our, 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 our community growing to the north, and I see it being very vibrant. But I think the biggest thing that we have to make sure is that with that community, we have community involvement. Like I said, the, the city commission ha has, has done that. I think we can do a little bit better job with it. Um, as Nancy had said earlier, and, and the rest of us, you know, we need to make sure that we allow our builders and we allow our developers to be able to grow with the community. And we need to streamline and with that growing community, we have to take a look at, at our personnel. We've had to do it with the school district. You have to add people uh, if you're growing. And we have to be able to look at that. I know it's going to take money to do that. That's why we have to look at alternative funding. We have to be able to use all aspects of that. But I think with uh, visiting with the community and getting ideas from everybody, we will be able to handle that. I've enjoyed raising my, my two boys here. They're going to graduate here, but they're going to come back to live because you know why? They love Bismarck, and so do I. I chose Bismarck as my home because I think this is an excellent community. There is a phenomenal quality of life here. Uh, I grew up all over the country in many different communities, not by my own choice, but by, by my parents' choice. And I have a lot to compare Bismarck to, and I can tell you that we are in a very, very wonderful place. So I chose to make it my home for that reason, and I think we have a very bright future. I believe that we can maintain our quality of life while we are growing, and that is one of the reasons I wanted to be a part of the commission. I think it's a very unique opportunity to take something that's wonderful and continue it forward. I'm very impressed that we have an ongoing effort to maintain a vibrant downtown. I know that downtown was talked about a lot earlier, and I think we have a spectacular downtown, and when I have friends that come to visit me here, they are completely impressed with what we have. So I think that that's important. I think we can continue that, and I also think that we can very thoughtfully think about how the outer line areas of town grow in a way that will not only um, keep our quality of life, but hopefully enhance it. Well, I would also like to thank everybody who took time out of their evening to come and listen to us uh, give our ideas and thoughts for the city, and thanks for the chamber for hosting it also. Um, what's my vision for Bismarck? Well, I've got several visions for Bismarck, but you know, number one would be grow it properly, and I think I'm very well qualified to do so. Um, we need to bring in a workforce, like I've said before. Uh, one of the things, I didn't think I'd ever say that Bismarck has traffic jams, but, but I'm learning fast that they do, and we're gonna need to plan, you know, for commerce to work, people need to be able to get to and from places, and I think that's another thing that we're gonna need to work on. Um, we need to keep it an attractive and vibrant downtown area, like it's also been mentioned. Um, I, I love our downtown area, and uh, you know, it, everybody complains about the parking down there, but I, I don't know, I, have, I have park in the parking ramps down there all the time, and I'm usually, while my friends are circling the block seven times, I'm already in, you know, ordering my meal, or <laughs> whatever it is. Um, uh, we also need to keep Bismarck just a fun, uh, great place to raise our family, and we need to develop uh, to meet our needs. And one more thing uh, in closing on this is we have something in Bismarck that not a lot of cities can say they have. Fargo has the Red River, which even the catfish complain that is too dirty. We have a beautiful river here that I think we really need to promote. Um, I think the city can get involved in this, and I don't know if anybody here has been to San Antonio, Texas and been to the Riverwalk there, but it's one of the most beautiful places, and I really think we can work to develop something similar to that to continue to make Bismarck a destination city. And with that, I thank you again, and I hope I can you know, get some votes on June 10th and not get skunked. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, my vision for Bismarck is that it's as great a place in 50 years as it is now, um, with the same sense of community, no matter how big we get. So we'll just need to keep planning and continue improving and continue growing at a pace that we can uh, do thoughtfully and efficiently.